across the globe as countries deal with the health impacts of COVID-19. They're also dealing with the economic impacts. The global economy has seized up. Supply and demand have been hit, the most basic of economic drivers. There was a huge economic problem during the financial crash of the 1930s. But now the global economy is much more complicated, interconnected, interdependent. Firms cannot produce the product. Customers cannot buy the product, even if firms are able to produce that. And that's what makes this whole thing so devastating. From its headquarters here in Washington, the International Monetary Fund has put together a $9 trillion pot to help countries deal with the COVID crisis. Most of that money has come from the G20, the world's richest nations, and more than 100 countries have asked for help. This is the IMF's map of where money has been distributed. Among those helped, $2.7 billion to Egypt, $411 million to Ethiopia, $361 million to Bosnia. And why? Well, take the Caribbean islands of St Vincent and Grenadines, an economy built on tourism which has completely disappeared. $16 million helps until things get better. The help comes through postponing, not cancelling debt payments. 64 countries in the world spend more on debt relief than health. That is temporarily halted. There are also additional direct loans and other instruments to ease the financial burden. And now you're saddled with additional debt from the IMF, then some sort of longer term um, plan and program is likely going to have to step in to help countries through that. So um, that's probably what we'll see happening, I think. I think the IMF has delivered the message that the recovery we have to hope for is, has to be a green recovery, that we have to do, use this as an opportunity to, to do the things that are necessary to deal with the effects of climate change. Uh, I mean, the crisis, we've all seen the pictures of, of um, nature reasserting itself in various areas, and, and I think people have begun to understand the impact uh, we've had. So perhaps that will encourage domestic support for actions. Countries will still have to figure how to pay back a lot of the assistance they're getting right now and when they'll finally be in a position to do that. Alan Fisher, Al Jazeera, Washington. OK, let's talk now to Dennis Novi. He's an economist at the University of Warwick in the UK. Dennis Novi, good to talk to you again. Why is the IMF support necessary as of now? COVID-19 is essentially a massive economic disaster, apart from the human costs. And therefore, you need some disaster relief. The obvious issue here is that lots of people and entire industries, as we've just heard in your report, are out of commission at the moment. People can't go to work. Businesses are shut. And you can't just let those parts of the economy go under entirely. Once and when the economies are coming back, you need those industries, at least some of them, to come back. And that's why you need money to come in and support those industries. In very rich countries, in Europe, North America, Japan, South Korea, you don't need the involvement of the IMF because those economies have enough fiscal powers themselves. But for a lot of poorer countries, you do need an outside source of funding, and that's why the IMF is stepping in. OK, in the wealthy countries, we've seen it today with the news about the Hertz car rental company. I'm thinking about Boeing, I'm thinking about Airbus. You know, you've got the, the macroeconomic picture, but you've also got the microeconomic picture. You've got small, privately run businesses, bars, restaurants, cafes, tourism-related industries and companies that will or have already gone under. And how does the money get from, say, the IMF to a government to those people who are on the tipping point of losing everything. Their turnout doesn't equate to a Boeing or an Airbus or a Hertz rental company, but it's still their livelihood. Yes, the IMF would uh, give out a loan to a government, say Jamaica is one of those countries that has received about 500 million US dollars. And then the Jamaican government would uh, distribute the funds. So a lot of that could actually be direct help in kind. So these could be food deliveries to communities. It could be support of health facilities, for example, funding for hospitals. But it could also be business support to keep vital parts of the economy functioning. So you're absolutely right. There are microeconomic condition, uh, conditions to be considered. How do we help individual companies, especially those companies that are really crucial, such as healthcare companies, 
And also, how do we keep the macroeconomy in check? But ultimately, that responsibility lies with the member states, and they are ultimately the ones who are in charge. And those countries that have asked for and are just about to get a big tranche of IMF money, they're already, in effect, in debt to themselves. I mean, the bank of the country that you want to talk about is, say, overdrawn. It's in the red. And now they're going more into debt with the IMF because unless they get some sort of debt relief or the debt is written off at some point further down the line, that money has to be repaid. That's the deal. The IMF makes money out of it. It wouldn't be doing it otherwise. It's true that the money will have to be repaid at some point. But if you look at the history in the past, especially some really poor economies, have received a lot of debt relief. So in practice, not all the money has been paid back. But of course, these countries can only pay back once these economies start recovery and start growing again. But this notion of debt is actually a kind of a tricky one. Uh, forget about the IMF for a moment. Just think about a huge economy like the British economy. The British state has a lot of debt and has accumulated debt over centuries now. Most of that debt has never been paid back. For example, the debt for World War II has never been paid back, and it probably never will be paid back. And the simple reason is the economy grows over time. So therefore, the debt burden shrinks because it has to be compared to a bigger and bigger pie. The economy keeps growing. And that's really what you hope for, also for these emerging economies. Once they grow, once the crisis is over, it will be much easier for them to pay back or at least keep that level of debt sustainable. So growth after the crisis is absolutely key. Okay, we must leave our conversation there, Dennis Novi. Thanks for coming on. Good to talk to you.